Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 13, Turning Deserts into Gardens. And the following is a sermon that I preached this past summer, actually on July 22nd. And as we were working our way through the Gospel of Mark, we came to a section in the Gospel where Jesus and his disciples are seeking rest in some desolate places and they are also seeking rest as are the people there in princely gardens and so there was some tie-in to understanding our role as the people of God in both turning these desolate places into garden-like places of rest with God and just following the last few episodes where we talked a lot about the garden temple in Eden and the role that Jesus played, the role that the tabernacle, temple, and priests of Israel played, and ultimately how that ties into the role of the church. These were some themes that I wove together in a way that pretty much summed it up with an exclamation point. And I think you will benefit from this. This was incredibly uh, powerful to me. As I said, I've been thinking about these themes for a number of years, but in this particular sermon, I was able to pull them all together and hopefully walk you through a little bit about the way that I look at the Bible and how I understand its themes to be related to each other. So again, I hope you'll be encouraged by this episode. I'd love to hear any feedback from you, but here we go. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Lord The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. Father, I thank you for giving us such a fascinating passage of scripture. Thank you for what you have taught me this week about you through digging into this passage and wanting to make it understandable for your people. So guide us by your spirit this morning so that we might see you and love who we see. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I I absolutely love passages like the one that I just read. Um, And what you'll find out if you look closely at the lectionary is that we actually skipped about 20 verses right in the middle of Mark 6. And that was intentional because next week we're actually going to look at John's version of that same account. The feeding of the 5,000 and the um, Jesus walking on the water scene. Um, But the lectionary has put these two together and at first it confused me. And then I think I saw how it fits together. So I'm really eager today just to tell you everything that I think is happening here. But at first glance, it kind of just looks like a general description of the kinds of things Jesus does. Jesus goes places, people who are sick come to him, and he heals them. You're like, okay, open and shut, pretty simple. But what I hope you're starting to understand the more you read Jesus is nothing with Jesus is simple. There's always much more going on, way more going on than probably any of us will ever understand. But I'm hoping to give you a little glimpse into some of what's happening. And this morning, what will make it a little more engaging is that we're going to need all four of our scripture readings in order to find out what that something more is. So if you have a Bible, you might be free to flip back and forth with me. But at the very least, turn it to Mark chapter 6. 
You have to remember as you get to the first few verses of our passage that our narrative comes on the heels of Jesus sending his disciples out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. They come back to Jesus in the very first verse that I just read simply to report to him all that they had done and taught. We don't know everything they faced. We saw last week that what John the Baptist faced while going out preaching the same message of repentance could have very similarly been what the disciples were up against. We don't know. But something about what we know is that when they come back from this trip, they're tired. But they have been preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus says at the beginning of Mark's gospel is at hand. It's here. The kingdom of God then is actually what Mark's entire gospel is about. And we're not even halfway through it yet. We're only in chapter 6. But the kingdom of God, I'm going to say this and say it again and say it again because it's really, really helpful. God's people in God's place, under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. This is a very helpful way of understanding God's relationship with his people beginning all the way back on page 1 of the Bible. God's people, the first man and woman, in God's place, a garden in Eden. Under God's rule, work the ground and keep it. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and enjoy God's blessing, the very presence of God. Every plant yielding seed for food is yours. Living under God's kingly rule was the way to ensure that mankind would experience the same rest God experiences when he finishes creation. A profound sense of satisfaction. A sitting back and enjoying his creation exactly as it was intended to be enjoyed and experiencing perfect peace and harmony. It is into this kind of rest that God has invited mankind to experience God's perfect satisfaction, peace, and harmony along with him. But very few people experience this kind of rest today. And that is because God's people were deceived into believing that stepping out from under God's rule was a better way to enjoy God's blessing. They thought that if they could decide good and evil for themselves, then they would be like God. Little did they realize that they were already like God. And that to be good rulers of God's creation, they simply needed to take their cues from Him. But they didn't. And because God's people didn't live under God's rule, they were sent out of God's place and away from his blessing. They were sent out of the garden to the east into the wilderness. The thrust of the entire Bible's message from that point on is how to bring mankind back into this garden-like state with God from his place in the wilderness. How to restore mankind back to his place over ruler of the creation. How to lead mankind back into God's rest. Samuel picks up on this very theme in the first verse of our Old Testament reading for this morning. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, and then the passage proceeds. David had a place to live. He had a house. And the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Okay, this looks promising. If I was reading the Bible from Genesis 3 onward and I came to this section in the Bible, I would think, place, rest? Wait a minute. I'm I'm reminding myself back to pages 1, 2, and 3 from the Bible. Is this how God intends to restore to mankind everything that was lost? Maybe. Maybe. But David notices that it's not his place that ultimately matters. It's God's place. And the fact is, God doesn't have a place at all. See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, 
But the ark of God dwells in a tent. And to David, this is a problem. So David offers to build God a house, a place. And God says to him, would you build me a house? I haven't had a house since I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this very day. Did I ever go around telling you that I needed a house? Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Okay. So in response to David's request to build God a house, God reminds David that he took him from shepherding sheep, made him a prince over his people Israel. He then tells David that he will appoint a place for his people so that they can dwell there and be disturbed no more and that violent men shall afflict them no more. Sounds an awful lot like a promise of peace and rest to me. And yet in at least one sense, God had already given David rest from all his surrounding enemies. We're told so in verse 1. So what does he mean by telling David in verse 11 I will give you rest from all your enemies. It seems to mean that at least in God's mind, there are other enemies that will need to be defeated for God's people to experience true rest. The fight isn't over, David. God is saying, your ultimate rest is yet to come. But I want you to notice what else God says to David. The Lord will make you a house. Now, we seem to be following along what David is saying. He's comparing a tent, which is insufficient, to a building that he wants to build for God because David lives in a building, a permanent location, and he wants God to have the same. But this whole thing isn't exactly what we would have expected God to say in response. We're introduced here to actually something very new. It's very new in the storyline of the Bible, House, apparently, doesn't just mean building or temple like the way David meant it. Based on what God is now saying to David, house apparently can also mean dynasty, family, or people. The place of true rest that all people need may very well come through a people or through a person a descendant of David, and that in him all people will find their way back to the garden with God. This person, it seems, may very well be the place where true rest will be found. And wouldn't you know it, this is exactly how the prophet Isaiah speaks about the coming of the Lord. In the face of Israel's waywardness, and idolatry, which Isaiah describes as a desert-like state. He looks forward to a day when all of that will change. A day when the Lord will restore to mankind all that was lost in the rebellion. And take a look at this. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden. Her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving in the voice of song. It's the Lord's promise of a return to Eden, to our long-lost place of rest, of mankind's restoration to a time of peace and well-being, coming back to the place of God's blessing on His people. But remember, this place, this house, 
will include rest from far more enemies than David ever faced. Okay. And now we're ready to reread our passage from Mark chapter 6. Listen to Jesus' words to his disciples upon their return from preaching the kingdom. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Now, this seems rather odd, doesn't it? Can you really experience rest in a desolate place, in an uninhabited wilderness? Doesn't rest with God come from a place more like a garden, like in Eden? You might think so, if the garden itself is what brings the rest. But if real rest comes in a garden-like state because the presence of God is there, then what you ultimately need for rest is God himself. And this is exactly what we find. The disciples are in much need of real rest, but as long as Jesus is with them, it doesn't much matter where they go to find it. Rest can come to them even in a desolate place. And the word translated desolate has a wide range of meaning. It could mean a desert, a solitary, lonely place, or a wilderness. But it can also be used of people. And when it is, it can mean deserted by others, deprived of the aid and protection of others, of a woman neglected by her husband, or in the sense that Jesus uses it, of a flock deserted by its shepherd. This is how Jesus sees the crowds that run there on foot just to get ahead of him. Yes, the crowds that flock to him, mind you, while he and his disciples are seeking their own rest. But Jesus sees these crowds and is filled with compassion because they are without someone to lead them to still waters or to restore their souls. In short, they are without someone to lead them to rest, to a garden-like state where they will find the life they seek. And so Jesus brings that rest to them. And if you read the passage all the way through, what you find, ironically enough, is that the disciples don't get the break they seek. Rather, in a strange turn of events, Jesus gives rest to his followers by inviting them to join him in giving rest to others. This is the great flip-flop that within the kingdom of God, mysteriously enough, real rest from God, real satisfaction from God through the Spirit can come when you are incredibly physically tired, but when you seek Him wherever He goes, wherever Jesus is, rest is. So if He is doing work as He turned the tables on many's heads in the, to- in the time of the Gospels, when Jesus always seemed to work on the Sabbath. And it made everybody angry. But he was coming to bring rest. And he offers that to any who come to him. But if you flip down a little bit, skipping that long section of the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the sea, it says in verse 53 that the disciples and Jesus came to land at Gennesaret. Now, You may not know this, but this is very, very fascinating and incredibly important to understanding what in the world is going on here. But in the ancient world, there were few places more lush and fruitful than Gennesaret. Its very name means princely gardens, and that's exactly what it was. Walnuts, palms, olives, and figs which usually require incredibly diverse conditions, all flourish together in Gennesaret. It has been aptly named the ambition of nature, supplying grapes and figs for 10 months of the year. In fact, the fruits from Gennesaret had such a reputation 
that the rabbis of Jesus' day refused to allow people in Jerusalem at the time of the feasts, that they refused to allow these fruits to come into Jerusalem during the time of the feast for fear that people would only come to the feast so that they could taste that fruit. So what we have in the land at Gennesaret is an actual garden, a place of abundance and provision, the very opposite of a desolate place. And yet if you read closely, the scene here is much the same as it was in the desolate place. All those living in this princely garden also come to the one they know can bring them the real garden-like rest of Eden. In verse 55, we're told that the people ran about the whole region, bringing everyone they knew in need of rest, not to feast upon the lush vegetation of Gennesaret, but to be healed by Jesus, the one who brings life and health and peace. If you don't pick up anything else in this passage this morning, take note of how much running is going on. There's a whole lot of it. People are sprinting madly to the one they know can provide them everything they need. In fact, this is exactly how the rest of our passage explains things. We are told that all of the sick, just by touching the fringe of Jesus' garment, were made well, were made whole. The word for well is the same term used throughout the New Testament when speaking of salvation. Sick people everywhere come running to Jesus in the hopes that they might just get to touch the fringe of his garment. Now the word that we translate sick can mean any number of things, ranging from physical illness to powerlessness, neediness to poverty. And so no matter who you are, where you live, what your life is like, or how well off you are, both those in desolate and fruitful places are still looking for rest. And if I could pause right here, I would say this. There are some who know that the circumstances they find themselves in, emotionally, spiritually, materially, financially, are desolate. They don't like where they are. They feel like that shriveled up bush outside in the wilderness that Jeremiah talks about, whose ways may or may not be in line with what God wants, but they feel like their life is way away from a garden-like state. Jesus has come to offer rest to you in that desolate place. He is not asking you to clean up things in your own life so that things will be more garden-like where God will feel more at home and want to come and be with you. He goes to the people in the desolate place and brings his rest with him to them. But then there are lots of other people who for the same reasons, socially, materially, financially, emotionally, find themselves in much more of a Gennesaret-type place. But Jesus is telling us something extremely important to understand. The rest that you seek will not be found in simply being emotionally more stable, financially more well-off, having more money coming in and less going out, or any of the number of things that our whole society spends billions of dollars and billions of man hours figuring out how to provide a Gennesaret type of a life right here. And yet in our passage, even the people who live in Gennesaret and have it all still know that there is something more to be had. And it is worth leaving behind and sprinting as fast as you can to the one you know will bring you something better. According to these passages, real rest is found in nowhere but Jesus, the place where God's people live under God's rule and enjoy his blessing. It is in Jesus 
where the blessings of God become ours for the taking, where people are welcomed back into God's rest, where we are shown that to rule by taking our cues from God is what it actually means to be human and where the peace that we all long for has been freely provided for us. Lisa read this for us from Ephesians chapter 2. Jesus himself is our peace. It's not that he gives us his peace. He is the peace. His presence is our peace. And Paul will go on to say in that very passage that all those who join themselves to him, and listen to this, with somewhat new eyes maybe, are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Oh. So now we know what God meant when he promised to make David a house. David wanted to build God a temple, a building, a house to live in. But get this, do not miss this. God is much more at home in a house made of people. And through his spirit, that is precisely where he now dwells. And yet it's not as if God ignores David's request. He just redefines it. With Jesus as its cornerstone, I mean, listen to the language. Paul is using cornerstone, structure, building, house, dwelling. You can think of all these things physically in a building, or you can think of all these things physically in a people. Paul has one thing in mind, and I think it's the one we should have in mind, and it is this. With Jesus as its cornerstone, the church, Paul tells us, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. And as long as we are connected to the cornerstone, we have the rest we seek, and now we become the place through whom God extends his blessing and rest to the entire world. Jesus brings rest to those in the desolate places. And he brings rest to those into the princely gardens because he himself is rest. And his goal has always been and will always be to restore and redeem all that was lost in the fall back to what it was in the garden. It is a healthy way of reading your Bible to read it like this. That the themes that redemption is aimed at restoring are all the ones that are spoken about in the first two pages of the Bible. Beautiful land where we dwell with God. That is what he's interested in restoring. And we don't even have to flip on the news for 30 seconds or check our apps on our phones or social media to know that we live in a world of incredible unrest. But our role and our task and our commission and our privilege as disciples is to learn how to so commune with Jesus who is rest that we can walk into these places of unrest calmly, lovingly, gently, firmly, beautifully, and share with our world, the people in our world, what real rest actually is how it's obtained, and what it's all about. That's our calling. But it starts with us knowing that Jesus has come to meet us where we are to bring real rest to us first. Let's pray.